1 over epsilon beams, and we need at least a few points in each of the beams. In fact, we actually need 1 over epsilon square, but let me gloss over that. We need at least a constant number of points in each of those beams. And so in order to get an accurate estimate, we need about 1 over epsilon points, at the very least. Okay, well, so suppose we try to do this in uh, d dimensions. So suppose now our data set is not in one dimension, but it's in capital D dimension. So instead of measuring the height of a person, we measure 20,000 genes for that person. That's what the gene array would do. So D would be 20,000. Well, I could ask what's the probability distribution of genes in, uh, in the human population. Well, how many samples do I need for that to get accuracy epsilon? Well, I would divide my Let's normalize the gene activity in 0, 1. So we are now in the unique cube in capital D dimensions, and I'm going to cut up the cube into epsilon cubes. And I want a certain number of samples in every one of those epsilon cubes in order to estimate what's the probability of getting uh, gene activity uh, in the cube. And now, how many epsilon cubes are in the data dimensional cube? Uh, 1 over epsilon to the capital D. And that's a ridiculously large number of uh, cubes and therefore samples that we need. For example, if epsilon is just you know one digit of precision, one tenth, and the dimension is a MOSES 100, I mentioned that gene arrays, for example, measure 20,000 genes, you get that you need about 10 to the 100 samples in order to start estimating this probability distribution. That's, that's a huge number. The number of atoms in the universe is between 10 to the 70 and 10 to the 80. So you will never get this many samples. Okay, so uh, a test that seems trivial in low dimensions, just be the histogram is totally infeasible in high dimensions. And so people have started wondering then, uh, you know, the same, the same sort of, so this reasoning is essentially sharp. It is not because we're being silly and just trying to do estimates by histograms. No matter what you do, the, the complexity of estimating probability distributions in high dimensions scales exponentially in the dimension. And other tasks, for example, predicting a function, suffer of the same course. So it's a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a general phenomenon. And so one has to make extra assumptions in order to be able to attack these problems. And the assumption that we're going to do in this talk, and it's not the only one possible, is that the data, yes, truly lives in capital D dimensions, but it has some geometry structure. And in particular, the data tends to accumulate near low dimensional sets. And so I might have data in 100 dimensions or 10,000 dimensions, but it accumulates maybe near a 5 or 10 dimensional set. And then my curse of dimensionality, I, I would like it to disappear and, and become a curse of dimensionality with respect to the intrinsic dimension of the data, 5 or 10. And so the question becomes, can we reduce the dimensionality of the data? Is it true that data is intrinsically low dimensional in ways that we're going to define? So I want to talk a little bit about low dimensional, what I call geometric models for data. I like to think geometrically, I'll, I'll them. all of these things could be cast and formalized in a statistical framework. And so this is a very old uh, problem. Uh, maybe the first construction is due to Pearson back at the beginning of the 1900s. It's called principal component analysis, which is one of the first things that uh, not only statisticians learn, but also that uh, you know, uh, is used in applications. You get a new data set, no matter what type, no matter whether it's actually a relevant thing to do or not, people usually do principal component analysis. And what is that? Well, and uh, I assume that many of you are familiar with this, but I'm going to go through this uh, geometrically uh, and also to set the notation for the rest of the talk. So suppose your data uh, is a set of vectors in Rd. D is, is capital D because D is big. And we have n samples, so you can stack those in a matrix D by n. And um, uh, you can always do a singular value decomposition on X, where you factor it as the product of U sigma V transpose, where V and V are orthogonal matrices, and sigma is diagonal. And uh, if the matrix X has uh, rank K, then uh, this uh, matrix sigma is also going to have rank K. So you're going to have K diagonal entries, which we usually call singular values, which are non-zero, and all the others are going to be zero. So you can detect the rank of the matrix in this way, uh, just by looking at sigma. But you can do more. So if the matrix is rank A, well, the data really lives in a k-dimensional subspace in capital D dimensions. And the first k columns of U actually span that subspace and give you an orthonormal basis for that subspace. Well, it's not very hard 
to find if the data truly lies exactly on a k-dimensional SS space, it's not hard to find that k-dimensional SS space. You pick, you know, k plus one data points and you look at their span. But data often has noise, or maybe it doesn't lie exactly on a k-dimensional SS space, but it lies close to it. Well, the sort of the composition is very stable when you add noise or you slightly perturb, uh, perturb your matrix. And so it's very useful because of that. And, uh, and I should also mention that this matrix sigma and the corresponding singular values measure variances. In fact, the first singular value measure the variance along the direction of maximum variance, which is also the first column of U, for the data X. And the second singular value, sigma 2, on the diagonal of sigma, measure uh, the maximum variance of X in the orthogonal directions uh, to U1, and so on. And so if the point cloud is long and thin, the first singular values and singular vectors span those directions, uh, and, uh, and the thin directions are measured by the smaller uh, singular values. So people have used this for data for a long time. Here is one example which is more recent due to Kirby. It suggested that in order to do face recognition, you might look at lots of pictures of faces. That's your high dimensional data set. And you can come to the mean face, subtract it out. So now we are centered at the origin and then do singular value decomposition and look at whether these faces lie on a low dimensional subspace or not. And uh, this sort of do. Uh, especially their center faces, like in the case of this data set. The really hard problem is when faces are being uh, rotated. And you, every one of the directions spanning of those subspaces is a face, or an eigenface, as they call them. And here are these eigenfaces, from the one that it captures the highest variability to the ones that captures high order and smaller variabilities. They are not particularly interpretable, and it turns out they don't work particularly well for face recognition, but they, they show that uh, you, know, you, you capture some, some of the geometry of that data. Now, here is a connection with uh, harmonic analysis. So suppose I take as a data set a set of images. I think I pick them uh, uh, 64 by 64, so we live in about 4,000 4, dimensions. And in each of the pictures, there is a random blob. I mean, a blob at a random location. The blob is always the same. It's just a Gaussian blob. And it's centered at a random location. So here are some of the data points. And uh, you can ask, do they lie in a low dimensional subspace? And so you can do principal component analysis. And you get uh, principal vectors, which are exactly the Fourier modes. And in a certain sense, that should be expected because this data set is translation invariant. And if you want to diagonalize translation invariant uh, operators or translation invariant data sets, the eigenvectors that you're going to get are going to be Fourier modes. And so you get 2D Fourier modes, one oscillatory mode, mode this way, another one that way. This oscillates twice and so on, higher and higher order. And so you can, uh, you can try to, you can look at the corresponding singular uh, values and these are the singular values represented in log scale so they decay exponentially this is essentially the Fourier expansion of a Gaussian so you would expect uh, exponential decay there is one problem though if you think about this data set so it lies in 4000 dimension and uh, but it, really the number of degrees of freedom that are here is not certainly 4000 in fact it's 2 because if I tell you what the center of the blob is you know the picture I mean, the blob is always the same, so if you know the blob and I tell you what's the center, you know the picture. So there is a map from 2D, X and Y, to 4,000 dimensions that completely describes the data. So the data is intrinsically two-dimensional. It's a two-dimensional strange manifold in 4,000 dimensions. And still, when we do principal component analysis, two does not appear here. I mean, you can zoom in up here, I swear. You cannot read the number two anywhere. So somehow principal component analysis is not detecting that this data is truly just intrinsically two-dimensional, even if it is. And the reason for that is that this data set is really non-linear. It spans many, many dimensions in 4,000 dimensions, and it does not lie exactly in any 2, 4, 10, <coughs> even 100-dimensional subspace. And so uh, there are many, even simple data sets are truly non-linear, and we would like to be able to uh, handle those non-linearities. So people, of course, realized this uh, uh, a long time ago, at least 15, 20 years ago. And they started to think about how to generalize a geometric model where you try to say the data is close to a low dimensional plane to models where you ask that the data maybe is close to a low dimensional curve plane, a manifold of low dimension. 
or and so that's one direction. This is really a high-level cartoon picture of you know a lot of research that is going on, and it's very reductive. But um, uh, that's one direction, and another direction is saying well. Instead of assuming that the data is close to one low-dimensional plane, maybe it's close to two low-dimensional planes, or you know, p low-dimensional planes. Can I find what those planes are? How many I need? Depending on the accuracy, the amount of data, and so on. And uh, both these research directions are well alive. They really took off in the early 2000s with a few uh, breakthrough papers like Isomap and Local Linear Embedding that tried to. Uh, attack this problem. So they realized that many data sets might lie close to nonlinear manifolds and the question was how do you learn uh, such a manifold? So um, one first thing that I think one should check when one is given a new data set is whether it is truly intrinsically low dimensional or not. And so uh, I wanted to briefly talk about how you go about checking if the data is intrinsically low dimensional or not. Because if it's not intrinsically low dimensional, uh, the course of dimensional is going to hit us. There is no point in trying to learn any manifolds or any low dimensional representation. And so this is a problem that was studied a lot, uh, uh, first by physicists, uh, who are asking about intrinsic dimension of attractors of dynamical systems. So they're usually worked in pretty low dimensional spaces and the dimensions of the attractors were weird, like not integer. Uh, we're not that interested in this sort of regime, we're interested in very high dimensions and uh, we don't think we will ever have enough data in that high dimensional space to really talk about fractional dimensions, or at least uh, not right now. Then statisticians took over and they made some modifications to the algorithms that the physicists came up with and then some machine learning people and then sort of people stopped talking about this problem like if it was solved. And of course, if you see 40, 50 papers, you start wondering, was it really solved? I mean, if it was really solved, maybe there wouldn't be 50 papers. And so uh, most, most of those approaches, I mean, probably like 46 papers out of, the, out of 50, uh, use the following idea. They say, pick a data point, pick a ball of radius r around the data point. Well, how many points do you expect in a ball of radius r? <coughs> well, I don't know, but when I change r, the number of points should scale like r to the intrinsic dimension because if, it, if, if a set is as dimension k, the volume on that set scales like, of a ball on the set scales like r to the intrinsic dimension. And so when I go and count my number of points in a ball of radius r, the number of points should scale like r to the intrinsic dimension. So pick a point, pick a radius r, count the number of points in there, <coughs> pick radius 2r, count the number of points, pick radius 4r, count the number of points, and then fit a polynomial uh, to the number of points that you have as a function of r. The exponent of that polynomial should be your intrinsic dimension. And uh, it's, uh, I think of this technique as requiring a number of points but is exponential in the intrinsic dimension because in a ball of radius 2r I want 2 to the k more points within the ball of radius r, if k is of intrinsic dimension. And we asked ourselves whether one can do better. And, uh, and also we were bothered by the fact that there was no paper where noise was discussed. What if the data is noisy? What if the data is not exactly k-dimensional? And so we proposed a different technique based on SVD. That's why I talked about SVD, besides the fact that it's probably the oldest dimension reduction method. And, uh, and we do the following variation of SVD. So suppose that the data is on some uh, low dimensional set, which are represented by this green curve M. And it's so the data was originally there, but then it's perturbed by high dimensional noise. So the noise is applied to each data point and it pushes the data point in a random direction in the high dimensional space. This is how many data sets look like. For example, you take a picture where there is the true picture, but then there is the noise com coming from the fact that you just measure a finite number of photons in every one of your, uh, in your CCD array, and so that creates noise. And it's high dimensional, it's one uh, noise per pixel, so it's truly high dimensional. While the set of images might have been low dimensional, like the pictures of those blobs. So there is a low dimensional manifold and noise. So what we suggest is the following, pick a data point, pick a ball of radius r, and instead of counting the number of points, do SVD, and look at the singular values. Well, if, and do this for all radii, and look at how the singular values change with the radius. Well, if the radius is really small, nobody's there, because the points that were here on M have been pushed very far 
from the manifold because of noise. In fact, one can show that, for example, if the noise is Gaussian, the points move by an almost deterministic distance in high dimension. This is uh, one, uh, one phenomenon which is called concentration of measure in high dimensions. So if you pick a radius which is small, nobody is in that ball. If you take a larger radius, all of a sudden you hit this red tube where the noise where I pushed most of the points. So as soon as the radius is about the radius of that, the radius of this ball is about the radius of this tube, then you see a lot of points, but it's just noise. So your, your um, principal component analysis is just going to tell you about the noise, which is not what you're interested in. When the radius increases even more, then you start seeing that something interesting happens. As you change the radius and the radius is above the size of the noise, you start seeing that there are k directions, where k is the intrinsic dimension of the manifold, that, and singular values that grow linearly in the radius of the ball. While there are other directions that do not change and whose length, measured by the corresponding singular value, is stuck at the level of the noise. And that's the range of radii that are interesting, that really tell you about the intrinsic dimension of the manifold. And so you can go and analyze this, this sort of algorithm and you can prove, 